people, it may just look like an overgrown garden with a bathtub in it. But for Steve Andrews, the back garden of his Cardiff home is a haven for wildlife. Steve is what you could describe as a colourful character, a self-confessed hippie, musician, UFO expert, and follower of a man who claims to be the reincarnation of King Arthur. Hmm, interesting. But his main passion in life is in the natural world, and he has transformed his home into a sanctuary for all kinds of rather unusual pets. Filmmaker Steve Jenkins has been to visit him in Ely to take a walk on the wild side. Are you paying attention, dog? C.J. Stone, in his book, The Last of the Hippies, describes Steve Andrews as a man living in Ely, an ordinary council estate where people get on with their ordinary lives. And in the midst of all this, you come across this extraordinary man living in an extraordinary house, a shrine to chaos, where Steve keeps his pets and his wildlife. I'm a, a singer, a songwriter, a poet. But I'm a bard of the Loyal Arthurian War Band and a quest knight. I am a bard of uh, Kaya Avery, which is Avery Stone Circle. I'm called Bard of Ely by Big Issue Cymru. I've actually got a lot of uh, young stick insects in this tank here. This is uh, a very young one, as you can see. Now, it'll grow a lot bigger than that. It'll grow about four inches long. What's the special fascination with these creatures? Part of the fascination is that they're all sort of unique. They're all very different. And they're not like insects that we have in this country. I've just got a few types here, and that, that'll, that's enough for me. Well, a lot of people, uh, they keep cats and dogs, and uh, which are, aren't very exotic. I, I keep things which are exotic, and they're a lot easier. Over here, I've got an axolotl. It's a Mexican salamander, and it lives its entire life in, in the tadpole stage. And at the same time, it can reproduce. So it's, it's a sexually mature tadpole is a bit odd. I also understand that in Mexico they eat them. Um, I wouldn't fancy eating one myself, but apparently that's what they do over in Mexico. They eat axolotls. And in here I've got some fire-bellied toads, and I'm hoping to breed these. Although at the moment there's nothing much happening. But that's the female, and you can see why it's called the fire-bellied toad. It's got a very bright, brightly coloured belly. It's, it's what is called a warning colour. If you have black and, and yellow, or black and orange, black and red, uh, these colours are called warning colours in nature. And they mean, sort of, don't eat me, I'm poisonous. Oh, look! Brilliant, look. They're now in a mating. There we are. They've got together specially for us. We were looking at the baby stick insects out, out in the kitchen earlier. And uh, I thought it might be of some interest here that I've actually got the adults. Um, w w well, they're dead. They've passed over, as they say. But um, I've put the, the bodies are up here on the wall, which gives you some idea of how big they actually grow to. But down here, in these little plastic containers, this is where I incubate the stick insect eggs. And there's just some soil in there. Let's see if I can get, get them out. That little black thing there, that is actually a stick insect egg. This book I've got here is by my friend C.J. Stone. Uh, this book's called The Last of the Hippies, and it's, it's his new book. And uh, I'm delighted to find that I, I've been given pretty in-depth coverage in here. There's actually a description of, of my walls, and it says, and then there's the walls, another jungle. A profusion of images, photographs, drawings, paintings, slapped up indiscriminately and charting in a higgledy-piggledy way the entire history of Steve's life and friendships, a testament to the extraordinary profusion of his mind. There is black and white and coloured photographs from around the globe, all of the people he knows or is in contact with, from Germany, from Finland, from America, from Australia, there's a whole vast world in there, or rather two worlds, the world of the natural and the world of the supernatural, coexisting in delicious harmony. 
Steve, it's not just keeping pets in the house, but you've got an interesting array of wildlife in the garden as well here. Well, that's right. I, I try to do my bit uh, for sort of conservation of nature by encouraging wildlife in my garden. And I've got a stinging nettle patch here, which uh, is great because it gets lots and lots of butterflies. Sort of they breed, their whole life cycle revolves around the stinging nettle. And I've had red admirals, which have successfully bred here. I've had tortoiseshell butterflies. And in fact, there's a, a nest of tortoiseshell caterpillars, which is just hatched out here now. They're very tiny, mine, so I don't know if you'll be able to see them, but they're actually on the stinging nettles. And I've got uh, a pond down here. Well, it's not actually a pond, it's really a bath. And I've actually got newts in here, I've got frogs in here. There's probably about something in the order of about 100 uh, adult newts living down in, in this pool, uh, which is quite remarkable, really. See, there's a, there's a newt there. Uh, that's a palmate newt, that's a female. That's a common frog, and that's a male. And I can tell it's a male, because he's got big fat swellings on his thumbs. I think you can see his thumbs here. He's got a big swelling there. And, and he use the, they use his big fat swellings on his thumbs to grasp the female frogs earlier in the year, down in John's Pond, down the road. Steve, what would you say about your relationship with the animals you've got here in the garden? I suppose it's a friendly relationship. I mean, I'm friendly to them. They're not that damn friendly to me, because as you can see, they're trying to clear off out of my way. But you can't blame them, really, you know. Uh, people don't do animals much good in general in the wild, you know, we tend to wreck where they live and do all sorts of nasty things to them. We've seen the frogs and the newts, Steve. Is there anything else of interest here in the garden? Well, there's also a lot of slow worms living here. Um, they've been here ever since I've lived here and they do quite well. And you tend to find them under stones and things. Well, actually, there's one there. Well, it's not very slow, as you can see. But it's actually a legless lizard. A lot of people don't sort of appreciate the nature that's around them. They don't, they don't see the things, and because they don't see them, they don't know anything about it. And they're so immersed in all of the things that we have in, in modern society, you know, they're immersed in computers and pop music and, and going out, you know, drinking and whatever, that they don't, they don't actually find out about, you know, the natural world that's there and has been there all along. There's a lot of sort of forms of nature living in towns and living alongside where, where we're living, but people don't tend to, you know, notice them. They, they don't know much about it. And so I, I think it's quite important for people to be educated uh, in, you know, finding out about the forms of life that, that we share the planet with. And there's something I'd want to show you over here. Uh, in, in relation to what I was talking about earlier, about how people don't notice things, there's a moth here, it's a very common moth, and this, that there, it's the buff tip moth. And as you can see, it looks just like a twig. It's a bit like a cigarette end as well, I think some people think. I've been interested in insects since I was a very young lad, I think it was about four or five. I used to go out in the garden and find insects, ask my mum and dad, what are these things, you know. And I used to spend a whole lot of my time when I wasn't in school or whatever, sort of looking for creepy crawly things. And I used to get lots and lots of books on these and read up on these things and also go out in the wild and find them for myself. Well, I'm still doing it.